Hello, welcome to a video that I've been talking about making for almost two years. Like either, it was either this part of 2015 or January of 2016 that I first talked about making a video showing what very few vinyl albums I had. At that time, I only had like two. So, and my intention was to include this in with my original collection video, if any of you remember that. Now, I'm not going to do a collection video this year, but I am going to do a video where I show you some new stuff I've gotten after I do the vinyls, or rather, at the end of this video. But to begin, I'm going to show off the vinyls I have. Um, vinyl records, of course. Um, this is one of the things I've kind of appropriated from my mom's collection, the uh, Blues Brothers soundtrack album. Um, I love the I love the Blues Brothers. It's probably in it's in my top three comedies of all time. And it's actually in my top ten movies of all time as well. I love that film to death. And it is, it is, it's the perfect musical. It's one of the greatest comedies. It's got a fantastic cast. Um, a lot of whom are deceased now, I realize. You know, it's got John Belushi, the uh, Carrie Fisher, you know, one of the worst law. We lost so many good people in 2016. Carrie Fisher was one of one of the absolute worst that we lost in 2016. I mean, rest in peace. Um, but no, the music on this album, fantastic. The music, that whole movie has a, has an amazing soundtrack, and this album is just amazing. Um, next up, this is one. This is a classic. This is one in pieces. Uh, this is comes from a, a relative of mine who probably bought this album when it was close to being new. Um, this this copy is probably older than my mother is. Lu Louis Armstrong plays W. C. Handy. This record is from like 1954. Uh, maybe not this itself, but the the performance is from the or some point in the early 50s. Um, I mean. Louis Armstrong himself's been dead for a long time, and you know, as you can you can see, the the record is the the uh, the package is pretty much coming to pieces, um, and the record the record itself is pretty scratched. You know, like like pretty much everything this particular relative of mine had. Um, I, I don't know if he didn't keep his stuff well, or I suspect he, he probably just played them to death. That is, that would be my suspicion. Um, going into stuff of mine, you have, uh, had to have this, um, Revolver from the Beatles. This is a, this is a new one. I bought this about... How long did I, ago did I buy this? I bought this about probably two years ago. Um, right, right around the time started to get money of my own for the first time. And uh, sounds great. Really, really like it. Don't don't play it as often as I might, you know, this but it's another one of those. If I was gonna have one vinyl record by the Beatles. Had to be Revolver. Although, the, I will say, this is the stereo. And, uh... As I discussed in my, uh... Mo when, I did, when I unboxed my Mono Beatles box, Revolver sounds best in Mono. So, I may have to get a Mono copy of Revolver on vinyl. Uh, Revolver and Rubber Soul, it's, it's amazing to me how much better they sound on Mono. Like, the... There's only one, there's only one thing on Revolver that doesn't sound better in mono, and that's Tomorrow Never Knows, because 
Tomorrow Never Knows loses a lot of its psychedelic wildness when it's not being played in stereo. Just some of the weird sound effects are different. You know, I will say I like the mono guitar solo a little better, but uh, I'm getting ahead of myself. Another thing from my uh, mom's uncle, the Boston Symphony Orchestra uh, playing works by, I think, Debussy, Ravel, Charles Ives. It's either Ruggles or Rougelais. Uh, I'm assuming it's French. Uh, you know, my, uh, this guy who, who a lot of these records came from lived in the Boston area, so he may, he could conceivably have seen some of these performances. Um, he had a lot of good, he got a lot of good classical records. Um, something I have never listened to. Um, oh yeah, I should say, I should say on that, I've listened to a few of these records. I've... It, it has, uh, what is it? By Debussy is Trois, Trois Nocturnes, I mean Three Nights, I assume. Um, Three Places in New England by Charles Ives. I've listened to that. I really, really liked Charles Ives. Um, he was on my hit list already because Frank Zappa cited him as a... Uh, as a uh, influence, and there were there was a Mothers of Invention piece called Charles Ives. I've never actually listened to this, the Bing Crosby show. Uh, I'm not even really sure what this is. Uh, my uncle had some pretty weird stuff, or my great uncle had some pretty weird stuff. Like he had the, he had General MacArthur's retirement speech from the from the Korean War on vinyl. It was it was a little odd. Um, Another thing of my mom's, Crosby, Stills, and Nash, Daylight Again, early 80s, su surprisingly good album, some really good songs on here. Um, some of my all-time favorite songs that they have ever done, like uh, Wasted on the Way, one of my favorites, Southern Crosses. Not necessarily my favorite, but my mom loves that song, and my and my parents played it a lot when I was young. Um, Daylight Again is one of their weirder songs. Uh, I think it was... Was it a cover? No, I, was it a cover? I don't know. Uh, but my favorite song on this album, by a very long shot, is Delta. And that just has one of their best kind of vocal melodies. I don't know, it's just, that that song has a very peaceful, very warm atmosphere, and uh, yeah, I really like it. Moving into some more stuff, Pierre Boulet conducts, however you pronounce this conduct, this composer's name, I, I give up, I, am, I have no idea, La Mer. Uh, I am not even going to try to pronounce that in French, because I don't do French. Maybe, maybe when we get to something German, I'll be able to, uh, pronounce that, but, uh, no, yeah, this is, uh, pretty good. I've, it, it skips, like, basically everything that came from him. This is cool. Duke Ellington and Louis Ar or Louis Armstrong, Louis Armstrong. I, I hate that there's more than one way to pronounce that name. Uh, Paris Blues. I think this is a soundtrack. I have never seen the movie in question. Probably never will. But I really like some of the stuff on here. Um, I have a yeah. I'm not quite sure where I was going with that sentence. Uh, this is one of the last destroyed sleeves in uh, of the albums that came from him, and uh, yeah. Okay, this has a favorite place in my collection, even though somebody wrote their name on it, um, which I don't get that, and it annoys me. Um, 
I suppose if you were lending stuff out, it, w it would make sense, but I'm a, I'm a very, but I don't really understand that either because I'm a very possessive person about things that I own. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I'm just cynical, you know, Duke, Genesis, you know, probably the best 80s Genesis album in my view. Uh, Abacab is great too, and I've got to get more Genesis on vinyl. Uh, I was, you know, and you know, I was just at the record shop and I didn't even think to look to see because I've, I've seen uh, so much good stuff there on vinyl. I've saw, I've seen Nursery Crime, I've seen some of the late, earlier Phil Collins stuff that's really good. Uh, this is a gatefold. I think this may have been the last Genesis album that had a gatefold. Um, because Abacab was just a sleeve. Uh, but I've always, I've always loved these little drawings. I love this little character that, uh... I've always heard that this character supposedly named Albert, but I really don't know. Um... So there, there's a, there's a Phil Collins jokey pseudo thing from the intro to one of the Duke shows where it's it's very obviously a joke but it's some people have argued that's actually what the plot line of du of the duke suite would have been um most of the people who know who follow this channel are probably genesis fans and probably know this but duke was at an early point of its career suppose at the or at the or during the early stages of developing this album duke was supposed to be it was going to be basically like a, a, a pop songs on one side, sidelong suite on the other side. I also, I also really like the label where you have all these, all these characters around. Like, but it was going to be pop songs on one side, one suite on the other side. But at some point during the development of the album the band decided that it was it would be too much like Supper's Ready and basically put the kibosh on that. They split up the, su the suite into multiple pop songs across the various sides of the album and basically the, the core of it is the beginning and end of... The beginning and end of the Duke album are, is the core of it. You know, it's... It's, uh... Behind the Line, Duchess, Guide Vocal, Turn It On Again, Duke's Travels, Duke's End. That was the order it would have gone in, and that's more or less what the pieces would have been. And uh, some of those pieces work better as full-fledged pop songs. Like, I think, I think that uh, Turn It On Again, on some level, had way too much potential to be a really good, catchy hit song to have ever been on a suite. Well, some of the other stuff, I don't know. This, it, I do wonder what, it, what the album would be like with that, but on, but on the other hand, I have a feeling it would be very uneven, and it would probably make it more like this album, the self-titled, The Yellow Shapes, where Genesis went full pop. And, uh, well, I shouldn't say that. There's still some, there's some very proggy stuff on this album, but about half of this album is very, very good. The first side, the first side of this album is absolutely fantastic. You've got Mama, That's All, Home by the Sea, Second Home by the Sea, that the Home by the Sea sort of suite is just one of the best things Phil Collins' Genesis did in the 80s. But then side two, Illegal Alien has not dated well. I could see in the early 80s it, Illegal Alien being a fun little song, but it's just kind of racist nowadays. Taking it all too hard is... A Phil Collins ballad, but I don't hate it as much as I should. Just a job to do is bad, and then both Silver Rainbow and It's Gonna Get Better are... Ah. Another thing from uh, Great Uncle, 
Benny Goodman, album of swing classics. This is this is like three or four discs. Uh, yeah, three discs. Like everything else of his, it is scratched to the moon. Like like this one, probably the worst of, of the ones that I have, I think. Um, Billie Holiday, Lady Sings the Blues... But it's not, it's not the Lady Sings the Blues that, that you know. Um, it's not, let me, hold on, let me come back. It's not this Lady Sings the Blues, it's something else, and, uh, it seems like this was a was some sort of foreign or French, maybe French thing. But then it says collector's edition, so I don't know what is up with this release of this album. I'm gonna have to look into that at some point. Um Ah uh, yes, yeah, some good stuff. Some very good stuff. Gustav Mahler, Symphony Number no. Four in G major. Um Let's see if this the one that has a. Uh... No, it's not. That I think that must be five. I think I have this. You know, I think I have this on CD, and I've or maybe that's f that's the fifth symphony. I've listened to this once or twice. I'm trying to. I've been trying to get into more of the sort of Western orchestral tradition because. Technically speaking, it's not classical music. I think this is considered romantic, but what do I know? And then another thing, this is uh, Mahler Symphony Number no. 5 in uh, C-sharp minor, uh, conducted by Leonard Bernstein. Um, and oh yeah, this is the Fifth Symphony, and then I think it's side three... Or no, I think it's side four has this, the songs, the Kinder Toten Lieder, or songs about children dying. Um, and, uh, yeah, it's interesting that this is Leonard Bernstein because, uh, interesting story. The relative who these records came from was a, his father was a teacher at the Boston Latin School, and supposedly he had Leonard Bernstein as a pupil at some point during his time there. Uh, granted, this this relative in que this the person in question that that my uh, great grandfather died when my mom was fifteen. So whether that's you know whether that's truth or whether that's family lore. Who knows? This uh, this is a special place in my heart because this this is the very first vinyl record I ever bought. This is Umaguma by Pink Floyd. This is the album. This is the Pink Floyd album that has got the. Let me take it out for you. The uh, this is the one that's got the live the really really good live album on disc one where you've got uh, Astronomy Domini, you've got Careful With It, you've got THE version of Careful With That Axe Eugene, Eugene, the definitive version of that song. This is, this is the best you will ever hear, Careful With That Axe Eugene. Uh, the Live at Pompeii one is good, but this is better. Um, you got a fairly good version of Set the Controls for the Heart of the Sun. And then, the, again, the best performance of A Saucer Full of Secrets. It's A Saucer Full of Secrets is almost a different song on here. It's got that, that drumming, the part with the percussion has got so much power. And then the ending with Gilmore's vocals is just a million times better than the choiry kind of thing they used on the studio version. And again, the Live at the Pompeii, the Live at Pompeii version of that song is excellent as well. But this is the best version. And then the studio side 
I don't know. The studio side, I mean... You have Sisyphus by Richard Wright, which is very good. Uh, it's Richard Wright showing that he was really a lot more talented than people have tended to give him credit for over the years. You have Grandchester Meadows and then by Roger Waters, and then you have one of the funniest things Pink Floyd ever did. Several small species of several species of small furry animals gathered together in a cave and grooving with a pict. Which is just Roger Waters making little animal noises and then a Scottish accent at the end. And then The Narrow Way, which is one of the best David Gilmore compositions. Really in all of Pink Floyd. The Narrow Way is great. I love I love that song. And then the track that messes up the entire album. It just, just Nick Mason, the Grand Vizier Chris Garden Party. I mean, who told him that was a good idea? Who told the drummer, easily the least skilled member of Pink Floyd, to drum? Because it just sounds like it's that flute intro and then it's... For like seven minutes. Or it's not good. Um, but the really funny thing to me is that you open up, it's a gatefold, obviously, you open it up, and you know, all these pictures of the band, you know, they're pictures that have been kept, all except for this one. To my knowledge, this picture has been deleted from the subsequent reissues of this album because it's, it's Roger with the woman he was married to at the time. And if you know anything about Roger Waters, you know that Roger has been married about 17 different times. Like, <laughs> it's, Bob Dylan did the same thing on Blonde on Blonde. There's a, there's a, in the original vinyl issues, there's a picture of him with the woman he did, he, who he wrote Sad-Eyed Lady of the Lowlands for. But, uh... That's been deleted because that relationship fell apart. And, uh, uh, in fact, it fell apart so badly that Bob went, was so hurt he had to go off and do blood on the tracks. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, one of the best things I got from this uh, uncle in question. Uh, in the wee small hours of the morning, Frank Sinatra... Probably, in my eyes, the best Frank Sinatra album. I don't know, there's something about Frank Sinatra when he's in full-blown, I, it's, it's two o'clock in the morning, I am, I am blind drunk, my wife just last, ju my wife just left me, and I want to kill myself. There's something about Frank Sinatra in that mode that is just sublime. And that is, to me, that's the best Frank Sinatra stuff, is the, like, depressed, I'm gonna kill myself Frank Sinatra. I think he called them suicide songs. Um, and that's his best, that's when, that's his best stuff to me. Uh, happy, exuberant, I'm on top of the world, Frank Sinatra. Is there a, did he do a song called I'm on top of the world? I think he may have. I don't really know. That Sinatra is not so much my style, but depressed, sad ballad Sinatra. That, I can really get down to that. And uh, this is my favorite album of that mode. I, this is uh, one of, there's a couple albums that this great uncle had that I loved so much that I went out and bought them on CD. This is one of them. Mahler's Fifth is another one. But yeah, I bought this on CD, and I actually listened to this quite a bit. Uh, not this vinyl. This album is very scratched. and uh, Unfortunately, it's scratched in the middle of my favorite song on the album, which is I See Your Face Before Me. Uh, I, re I really like the strings in that one. Uh, but yeah, this, and this I had to tape because this, this sleeve is coming to pieces. Um, another sleeve that's coming to pieces. This one I didn't tape. Uh, probably the more famous, maybe, maybe more cla considered more classic album, Come Fly With Me. 
uh, which has a fair number of famous songs on here, certainly the title track. Um, I'm not surprised, I, I'm not surprised that, uh, these are scratched so much and that the, the sleeves are so destroyed because this, this great uncle is about 90, 93 or 94 years old and he probably bought these albums new. Um, oh yeah, some, this is something I bought on CD True. Uh, Richard Strauss, or I think it's Richard Strauss, is how you say it in German. Ein, Hel Ein Heldenleben, or A Hero's Life. Uh, really, really good stuff. Really good, romantic kind of symphony stuff. And, uh, yeah, it's just... It's, this, and, you, and this is one of the... This is one of the better records in terms of... I don't think this was played very much at all. Because it hardly scratches, it, it hardly skips at all, and it's hardly scratched. Um, you know, which is, uh, and the sleeve's in really good shape for, which again, for something that is probably at least 40 years old. Another thing, uh, again, I have this on CD. I actually have this on the CD bundle with uh, Ein Heldenleben. Uh, also Sprach Zarathustra. Um, the famous one conducted by Zubin Mehta. God, that's, uh, it's like, this is like the, the six degrees of Frank Zappa going through this record coll collection because we had... We had Pierre Boulet, and now we have Zubin Mehta, who, who I guess Zappa was friendly with. I know he calls him out in, uh, in a uh, Billy the Mountain, uh, what was it, when they're talking about Studebaker, Studebaker Hawk, and he's like, some people say he looks like Zubin Mehta. What is it? Some people, but some people say, no way, he's just some other greasy Italian guy, or something like that. Uh, something very funny and offensive to Italian people. Uh, more, more Pierre Boulet, uh, Le Sacre du Printemps, The Rites of Spring. It's The Rites of Spring in its original French title. This, again, something I found in here, and I guess I knew The Rite of Spring, but I had to have that on CD because The Rite of Spring is just... If you've never heard The, Rite of, the Rites of Spring listen to it, T turn off my video and listen to it now because that is one of the best Western orchestral works of the past century. It is, it is incredible just what Stravinsky was doing there. Um, and if you're a Frank Zappa fan, you should doubly listen to The Rite of Spring because once you know The Rite of Spring's you know that Frank Zappa was, throughout the 60s, sneaking parts of the Rite of Spring into his works. Like, uh, the vocal har throw out an example of Reuben and the Jets. The vocal harmony when, at the end, where they go, Fountain of love, ooh, that's how the Rites of Spring began. So... Yeah, it was Zappa throwing his man Stravinsky in there. Now, Vanilla Fudge, near the beginning. Parsh I believe this is a, mostly a live album. You have their cover of Shotgun, their cover of Some Velvet Morning, which is fantastic. Like, it is awesome. Where is Happiness is very good as well. And then Break Song... I've only heard Break Song in full once, but I remember it being very, very good. I'll admit I haven't listened to this album off. And this, this one came out of the cutout bins, if you can see that. I didn't used to know what that meant. I, ha I actually have several CDs that are like that. I have, a, uh, I have a, my copy of, or one of my copies of Smashing Pumpkins. Uh, 
how am I blanking on the name of that album? Um, it's the one that's got today. It's got Cherub Brock. It's got mayonnaise. It's got uh, what's what's the other big song on that? On their uh, Siamese Dream. That's it. Um, I, my copy of, Sma of Siamese Dream by Smashing Pumpkins has that notch cut in there. My copy of Inner Revolution by Adrian Ballou has that on there as well. Um, and a, a more modern variation, several out. I own multiple albums that had holes punched through them in the CD cases and the CD backings too. And basically it was when your record store didn't sell enough. They would do that and then sell it at a lower price. Or when your record store didn't sell sell something within a certain window of time, I think it was multiple years, they would they would cut a they would cut a notch into the spine and they would slash the prices and try to get rid of it. And uh, honestly, the thing about vanilla fudge, these guys must have been really popular. Either that or a lot of people a lot of people got old and realized they didn't like them. Because you can buy just about every 60s Vanilla Fudge album for about 10 bucks. I paid like $3 for this. Like, no tax, even. Like, $3 for this. And, yeah. Good album, though. Speaking of something I did not pay $3 for, that was a little more expensive. And another one of the, like crown jewels of my vinyl collection. This is the, actually the final one. So, actually, no. There is some more. There, was, there is some more. One of my favorite albums of all time. Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. One size fits all. Again, this, this one, I, I found this at that same record shop. Actually, no. It was the same record shop, different location. Um, that I found the Vanilla Fudge at, and this is fantastic because this, this plays perfectly, thankfully. You have the, you have the, uh, gatefold, you have the, uh, let me pull it out, and, uh, Frank Zappa had multiple custom labels over the years, you know, he had Bizarre Records, he had straight records. He had Zappa records. Um, but this was, you know, this, Discreet Records. This was his uh, 70s Warner Brothers era record label. Um, Herb Cohen. Or is it Herb Cohen or Herb Cohen? I, I, Cohen also had some do dealings there. Uh, I want to say some Tim Buckley albums came out on Discreet Records as well. Um, some of Tim Buckley's more questionable later records. Uh, poor Tim Buckley. But no, this, uh, this album is fantastic. This album is incredible. Like, this, this whole album is just... The, I'm, I'm going to say it right here. On a certain level, this is the very best Frank Zappa album because this is, you've got it all here. You've got the good songs. You've got the instrumentation. You've got the humor. The first track on here, Inca Roads, is just, it's like nine, ten minutes long. It's this fusion-y thing. They're singing about the... Did did the Indians in Peru build the Nazca lines or Nazca lines? Did they build it for aliens to come in and land? But it, but they're not taking it seriously. They're they're very very much having a joke about it, and the whole album is just great. Like you have the you have the constellations on the back, which is just like every Zappa reference you could imagine is on here. Zubin Mehta. We were just talking about Zubin Mehta. He's, he's listed on this outer ring here of this, uh, whatever this is. And I like the, like, the geological, the geological, like, thing. But you have ants in there, and you have a squirrel sleeping underneath somebody's farm. Uh, great stuff. Um, 
Now, I have these. These are again from these are from an uncle. These are from the same uncle. These I'm forgetting 10 inch records. Before 12 inch LPs became the norm, there were 10 inch vinyl records. And those were around for a couple of years. A couple of artists put, put albums out on them, and they're they're very interesting, and they're not really around anymore. Um, and uh, I don't know, they're a novelty. Almost all of these are scratched, like ugh, way scratched, but I keep them for the novelty mostly. Bing Crosby, sort of a greatest hits collection of the 50s. Um, this is incredibly scratched. Like, you can't even play this. It is that scratched. Like, it is bad, 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 bad. Errol Gardner, Piano Moods, also scratched to the moon. Basically unplayable. Um, and finally, the two mini-albums that Frank Sinatra did before he did uh, in the wee small hours. Um, yeah, you, this one's this one's case is destroyed. The the sleeve is destroyed. Uh, I think this has by far the better album cover of the two. I mean, I'm not a big fan of album covers where it's just uh, look at me. I'm in a nice suit. You know, I'm I'm looking good. Uh, pout to the pout for the camera a little bit. I'm not a big fan of those album covers, but this this is a fairly good one. This is just whatever, you know. It's just whatever. Um overall, I'd say I've I've listened to these about the same amount, but I slightly prefer this one. So yeah, so those that is my vinyl collection. Now, the video is not quite over because I'm going to show you some CDs that I've gotten lately. Um, including some that I would like to raise awareness of. One of which I'm going to do definite, actually not one of which, two of which I'm definitely going to get a review of at some point. Uh, just give me a moment because I have to get one of them that I already put in my shelf. And I'm back immediately through the wonders of video editing. So yeah, so I've been getting into David Bowie in a really big way lately. I wasn't into him for a long time, but he finally clicked with me, thankfully. Uh, you know, almost two years after he died. I, uh, that's, that's always probably going to be one of my musical regrets, that I wasn't into him when he died, but what can you, what can you do? In some ways, maybe it was better that way. I, I, I lost enough people I lo people who I loved musically in 20, 2016, 2017. You know, we lost Keith Emerson and Greg Lake. We lost John Wetton. You know, those, that, John Wetton was like, I don't remember whether that was 16 or 17, but John Wetton was probably the biggest, aside from David Bowie, the biggest, like, slap in the face in terms of someone dying in the last couple of years, because, you know, he was in King Crimson. He was in the best version of King Crimson, man. Um, really, really sad. I, he died way too young. All of them died way too young. But I've got, I got Lodger, the last album in the Berlin Trilogy. Um, not anywhere near as good as Low and Heroes, but very good at the same time. Um, I actually think the album they did afterwards is a little better. And that is uh, Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. At least I think. Is that it? Yes, and Super Creeps. Really, really good stuff here. It's No Games, Part 1 and 2. Scary Monsters and Super Creeps. Ashes to Ashes. Fashion. You got Robert Fripp on here again doing the guitar and fripping, his, fripping away. Really, really good. The... The cover is so, so 80s, and yet this really isn't an 80s album, even though it came out in 1980. It's more like, it's very, very much a continuation of what he was doing in the very late 70s. Um, 
really good. I, one little thing I will add while I'm talking about uh, Frep, I've always thought that the that the 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 main like ref to uh, it's no game reminds me a bit of Vroom from '90s King Crimson. Not so much in like the melody, but in the the background. Do 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 do. It's very similar, but. I'm probably gonna get another comment where it's like, I studied music theater, I studied music theater for 15 years, and I can tell you, sir, that you are wrong. And at which case, I, I do have to, even though I did get a little snarky with that guy, I do have to concede, yeah, yeah, I am wrong. If, if you, because I, I don't know anything about music. I have an instrument. I make noises on it. Occasionally those noises sound good, but I know nothing about music. I know nothing. I mean nothing about the structure of music. I don't even fully understand time signatures or anything like that. But yeah, so I've got that. And then if we're going to take it chronologically, I got Black Tie, White Noise. This is a weird album. This is David Bowie doing early 90s black dance hip-hop kind of music you know it's new jack swing i think is what some of that kind of stuff is called it's it's very good but it's got a fairly passionate group of people who hate it and i totally understand why because it is it's not rock and a lot of people when david bowie wasn't doing rock they, they, they didn't want to hear it they didn't they didn't like it you know, he had to be doing rock, and uh, I know a lot of people who hate on all of his 90s albums because of that, which is so, so dumb to me. This is Outside. This is David Bowie's album from 1995. This album is incredible. You need to, you, you people need to listen to this album. Turn this video off, listen to this album right now, because Outside is... May, it may be the best David Bowie album I've heard, because my favorite is Diamond Dogs. My favorite of his albums, Diamond Dogs, primarily because of it's got... it's Diamond Dogs is just crazy. You know, you have the Sweet Thing, Candidate Sweet Thing, Reprise, Little Sweet Thing. <laughs> sweet Thing. You have... We Are the Dead, which is just, it's, it's barely even has a structure. It's just kind of him just chant, not chanting, just like reciting these weird lyrics over this really atmospheric piece of music. And it's just this really grim, psychedelic, insane stuff. And the 1984 is great, but then uh, and then uh, Big Brother into the the chant of the ever circling skeletal family, just incredible. And this album, this album brings back that insanity. It bring, but it brings back that insanity for the 90s, because this album has a big industrial kind of influence on it. There there are tracks on here where you can you can hear. They kind of sound like Nine Inch Nails. They kind of sound a little bit like a, a, maybe a little bit of ministry, you know, some, some really cool electronic, a really cool industrial, but just insanity. This album is a con, this was a concept album. It was, technically it's called Number One Outside, the Nathan Adler Diaries. What was it? A non-linear gothic hypercycle. And it's based, the way I described this album to a friend is it is, sh think Shades of David Lynch and, a cy and cyberpunk dystopia. Because it's about this alternate, nine, alternate dystopic 90s where artistic murder is this huge social problem. And this guy, Nathan Adler, is part of this agency or this company that investigates art murder to try and determine whether the murder was was tr good and artsy or whether it was trash and bad and he's just he's investigating the the really really nasty murder of this 14 year old girl this baby baby grace blue and just the booklet in here when they talk about the murder itself it is 
really grim and really messed up. The booklet is almost like the script, the script to like some cyberpunk movie. It's just this whole album is just um, incredible. It's he got back with Brian Eno after almost twenty years, and it's just. Like I said, Diamond Dogs is my favorite David Bowie album, but this is top five material, and this is anybody who likes David Bowie, anybody who likes, I would actually say anybody who likes weird, crazy, industrial-esque kind of music, check, it, check this album out right now. Turn the, turn the video off. Check this album out. Um, while we're going through David Bowie, next one up is uh, Earthling. I have a review of this in the works as we speak. This, simply put, this is David Bowie doing... This is David Bowie doing drum and bass, big beat electronica, jungle music. Everything sounds like The Prodigy. Everything sounds like Aphex Twin. It's... But just with David Bowie singing over it. And, uh... Yeah, I'm not going to really give my thoughts away on this album, because I am going to review it. But, yeah. It does have a cool cover, uh, you know, the Union Jack flag. I, I want to say that came out during that part of the 90s, where Britain was going through that really nationalistic, like, kind of like, we're hip, our economy is booming, it's new labor, uh, cool Britannia. I think, I think that was what they called it. Um, and now, things connected to David Bowie. Uh, Mott the Hoople, All the Young Dudes. This is their one glam album. This is... David Bowie, as I understand it, basically saved this band. You know, this band was like a... They were like a mediocre hard rock band that David Bowie, I guess, was following. And so, they, he gave them his his song, All the Young Dudes, and, you know, it's crazy, because that's, like, one of the best songs he ever wrote, and he just gave it away to this, this really not very good hard rock band, and they had a huge hit with it, and this, I think, easily the biggest album they ever did. Uh, speaking of glam, this is the, the Slider, T-Rex, uh, Metal Guru, the rest of it, it's really that one song, and then uh, everything else is pretty good, but Metal Guru is great, great, great song. T-Rex was never the greatest at making consistent albums, I think. Um, and then uh, two things, the, the Charlatans, Some Friendly, uh, this is 90s Madchester baggy indie rock, I guess is what you call this. I, I don't really know. I like this a lot. Uh, and then uh, some things that my Crimson, fellow King Crimson fans may appreciate. Uh, Sylvian Fripp, The First Day. Uh, I'm not even sure what to classify this as. It's as I understand it, it's mostly David Sylvian with Robert Fripp soloing over it. But then again, some of the longer stuff, I think Robert Fripp played a big creative role in. And it's credited to both of them. It's David Sylvian and Robert Fripp. That's the name of the group. Um, but uh, this picture of David Sylvian to me is hilarious because... Uh, just just the way David Sylvian looks in all of these pictures, you know, he's he's clearly settling into his middle-aged man phase and uh I don't know. It's it's funny to me because uh of the way David Sylvian looked when he was at the peak of his fame with Japan uh and uh look that up. It looked that up, or maybe maybe I'll post a picture right here. He looked good, but he looked completely ridiculous all at the same time. It was it was one of those one of those things. Uh, and then uh, something I got that I've been wanting for a long time. 
this uh, I've got on a whim. Uh, the collectible King Crimson, the live in 1996 uh, in London at the, I guess, the Shop Shepherd's Bush Empire was the name of the venue. <coughs> I got this because it was cheap. I understand that this series was basically, they were collecting some of the less popular King Crimson Collectors Club stuff, which is, for, the, for those of you who don't know, that's like King Crimson's version of like Bob Dylan's bootleg series. Or something like that, where you take you you take recordings that of you basically gather as many live recordings as you can, and you put them out yourself. You beat the bootleggers, to use Zappa's term for I think it was his series was called Beat the Boots, um, and you you put those records out there for people and you let you let them hear that you know this one apparently came from the band's soundboard mix uh, is the the double trio live at the height of their powers in 1996 that was the best that the double trio ever were and uh, yeah it's just man they 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 were on fire here they're they they go they're playing some of these songs. Like, the booklet even says they're playing frame by frame faster than frame by frame was ever meant to be played. And you can hear Adrian Ballou just going ahead like a race car, and, and Fripp is just kind of keep trying to keep up in the background. But, yeah, some really good performances on here. I Neurotica, I love. I love the 90s performances of Neurotica, but... Uh, yeah, I have to. I have to speed through this, or this will all. This will. We will. We will have ten minutes of me just ranting about how much I love the double trio and how good '90s King Crimson was, and how much I love Thrack, and how desperately I wish the double trio had done another album, and that King Crimson hadn't covered up, or not covered up, hadn't followed Th Thrack. One of my all-time favorite King Crimson albums with The Construction of Light. One of my all-time least favorite King Crimson albums. But, yeah, that's, that's for another day. So anyway, I'll see all you guys later. Some point in the next little bit, I am going to do a video showing you guys all of my box sets and whatnot. Or maybe I'll decide to do a different video for that, a sub-video for that. I don't know. Leave in the comments what you think. What did you think of the video? What do you think of the thi of what I showed you? And what do you think about future videos I should make? So anyway, see ya.